because we're going to look at uh, Ezekiel 36 and 37, and in particular, uh, this idea of the new covenant. Welcome. Please come in. Uh, in many ways, the new covenant is the way to bring both the Old Testament and the New Testament together. Uh, when you look at this passage, when we look at the uh, full implications of this passage, this is going to be a key to our understanding the, the whole Bible. And uh, you may uh, recall from the syllabus that we're actually memorizing this uh, section. So uh, I know some of you have already uh, completed that or uh, in the process of coming by to recite that. But this is key. This is absolutely key to understand uh, what the whole Bible is about. I'm really excited that we get to look at it today. So the main points of my talk uh, this morning will be this. Uh, it will be, what is the new covenant? And the passage there is Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. We're going to look at... Uh, what exactly it means when it says a new covenant. We're going to see that Jeremiah's friend Ezekiel, they were roughly uh, lived the same time period, uh, uh, Jeremiah a little um, uh, older than Ezekiel, but Ezekiel 36, in effect, is the study Bible notes to Jeremiah 31. We're going to see that many of the same promises are gone over in that section. And then we're going to step back and look at the whole Bible and see that Ezekiel 36 and Ezekiel 37 plays a massive portion in New Testament theology. Um, and I, I think of all the points that I'll make this morning, probably this one it, someone would say, well, I, I'm kind of skeptical about that. Can that really be true? I, I've never really heard of these passages before, and so we're going to look at that. We're going to see that Ezekiel 36 connects Eden, the Mosaic Covenant, the New Covenant, and the Promised Land. All of those uh, together in one passage. And we're going to see that Ezekiel 37... And if you've ever um, uh, been familiar with that uh, Puritan uh, prayer book, uh, The Valley of Vision, that's about Ezekiel 37. Um, we're going to see that that's a picture of what all this is talking about. So those are uh, what I would like to talk about today. Let's dive in. So what exactly is the New Covenant? And to understand what the new covenant is, we probably should ask, what's a covenant? A covenant is an agreement between two parties, and it's somewhat similar to a contract. So if you ever uh, bought a new car and you signed a, that document, that's kind of like a covenant. A covenant is more than that, but it, it's kind of like that. It's, it's an agreement between two parties. Now, in the Bible, nearly there are lots of covenants. So there's a covenant with Adam, a covenant with Noah, a covenant with Abraham. We looked at last time the covenant with Moses. There's a covenant with David. Today we're looking at the new covenant. In, in the Bible, it's always, nearly always a superior, and that superior's relation with relationship to an inferior. So a covenant is a contract, but it isn't a contract between two equal parties. It's a contract between a superior and an inferior. And a picture of that uh, ancient thing that covenant means, uh, Hebrew word barith, uh, the picture of it is in Genesis 15.10. And if you've read that, uh, I, I may have had you read that in the homework, but if you've read that, Abraham does this really weird thing in that God tells him to go get a bunch of animals 
and to cut the animals in half and arrange the pieces. And what he's doing is setting up an ancient covenantal ceremony. And what should happen in that ceremony is that the inferior person in the agreement walks between the slaughtered animals and recites the terms of the covenant and basically is saying, if I don't live up to my uh, obligations in this covenant, may I be like these animals. Uh, may the curses fall on me of this covenant. Now, what's really weird about that is uh, Abraham does it, but then God flips the table. Let's read it. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And you may have picked up that that term, deep sleep, uh, in the Hebrew text, this is exactly the same thing that falls on Adam before God uh, takes uh, Adam's rib and fashions it into a woman. Now Abram is falling in this deep sleep, this tardema. And behold, a dreadful dark, uh, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And then the Lord said to Abraham, Know for certain that you and your offspring will be sojourners in a land that's not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. That really doesn't sound like a covenant so far. The weird part comes when we come to these verses. And when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. This is normally what the inferior partner in a covenant would do. And God is somehow taking the part of the inferior partner. It doesn't make sense. Why would God be doing that? On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river of Euphrates. And you might have picked up, that's kind of echoing the border of Eden when uh, Eden is described there in Genesis 2. God is entering a covenant but it looks like God has assumed the responsibility of the inferior person in the covenant. It doesn't make sense. Why would that be the case? When we come to look, uh, to compare and contrast the Mosaic covenant and the new covenant, the Mosaic covenant is just a standard covenant. It's a superior telling an inferior, these are the rules. If you follow the rules, you get to stay in the land flowing with milk and honey. If you break the rules, that land will vomit you out. And we've seen before that that's kind of the same deal that God had made with Adam. If he followed the rule, don't eat, uh, then he gets to stay in and all his natural offspring get to stay in. But if he breaks the covenant, then he's thrown out. The Mosaic covenant is just that same covenant all over again. Uh, these are the laws. We saw those laws last time. Uh, they, they aren't uh, uh, impossible. The Israel should have followed that. Uh, and the deal was, if you follow these laws, you get to stay in. And Israel didn't follow those laws and were kicked out. That's the Mosaic Covenant. God 
in Jeremiah 31 starts talking about a new covenant. I'm going to implement a new covenant, a new agreement. And this is what the text says. And if we, if we went to a concordance and just looked up the term new covenant, it would pull these um, references up. And you can see that the only place in the Old Testament where the word New Covenant appears is Jeremiah 31.31. 31. But you can see the New Testament is all about the New Covenant. So what we're going to look at today is, okay, why is the New Covenant so important for Jesus and the New Testament writers? This is what the New Covenant says. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, a new agreement, a new contract with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And it will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them. That's the first promise. I will write it on their hearts. That's the second promise. I will be their God, and they will be my people. That's the third promise. No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Jeremiah had pointed out Israel's unfaithfulness to the Mosaic Covenant. Uh, he had pointed out all the ways that Israel had failed uh, to live up to the standard that God required. And God says, I'm going to make a new covenant. The first covenant was written on tablets of stone. I'm going to write this new covenant on your heart. And, um, and I'm going to forgive your sins. And I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. If we want to understand what's going on, it might be helpful to just step back and look at a whole Bible biblical theology. What the whole Bible is about is about getting the people to live in the garden of pleasure with God. The Bible starts with two people in the garden of pleasure. God brings them together. It's God's intent that those two people love each other. And in fact, God wants those two people to love each other so much that they have children and those children are little God lovers and God's uh, revealed will was that the whole world would just be filled with little God lovers from this new couple who love each other and who love God and who live in the garden of pleasure. That's what God's revealed will was. That's, that's what he was uh, uh, aiming to happen. That's what he was uh, telling them he wanted to happen. But the problem is man broke that agreement with God. And God had said, in the day you eat it, you will surely die. So this man and woman who um, was created by God to be God lovers and just to fill the whole world up with God lovers, he died spiritually. And he not only died spiritually, but he began to reproduce after his kind. And so he was spiritually dead and all his natural offspring was spiritually dead. 
God wanted the garden of pleasure filled with God lovers, the whole world filled with God lovers. And so how is that going to happen? We've seen the end of the Bible is a restored garden of Eden with the tree of life, the river of life, uh, people with God in a temple in the restored garden of Eden. But the question is, how does that happen? And how it happens is the new covenant. God is saying, this is how I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to create a new covenant. Ezekiel, when he begins to explain Jeremiah's promise, notice he uses the exact same terms. This is God uh, speaking again. He says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put in you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. God had written the Mosaic law on tablets of stone and God says, I'm going to take that stone away from you. I'm going to take that dead heart away. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do what David pled for me to do. Create in me a clean heart, a pure heart, O oh God. I'm going to do that. I'm going to put it within you. I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, a heart of real flesh. God's solution is the new covenant. How is he going to make a, a world full of God lovers? This is how he's going to make a world full of God lovers, through the new covenant. And that's why the New Testament writers were so fixated on this promise in Jeremiah and then its uh, fuller explanation in Ezekiel 36, because Jesus, less than 24 hours before he died, when he's implementing uh, the celebration of the Lord's Supper, these are the words that he chose to describe what he was doing. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant. What Jesus is saying is what I'm going to do tomorrow is going to pay for the new covenant. What I'm going to do tomorrow is going to give you the right to participate in God's new covenant. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant. Well, let's look at the details of the new covenant. Let's look at exactly what God uh, is promising to do in the New Covenant. So this is Ezekiel's uh, fuller version of it. Uh, Ezekiel uh, is quoting uh, God here. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, my name which you have profaned among the Gentiles to which you came, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, my great name which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them, and then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. Now, if we were Jewish people and we were reading this in Hebrew, there's something that happens in this text uh, and it's called an inclusio. And what an inclusio is is where you start and end with the exact same words. And you don't even have to be able to read Hebrew to tell that these two sentences are exactly the same uh, sentences. Not for your sake am I acting, not for your sake am I, am I acting, 
And that's what's going on in these two verses. And what it's saying is, this section is a promise. Take this promise as a whole. This is really important. God puts it in an inclusio. And this is what's included in the inclusio. This is, um, this is Ezekiel spelling out what Jeremiah had promised. He says, I will take you from the nations and I will gather you from the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean from all your uncleannesses. From all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart. So he's quoting Jeremiah there. I will give you a new spirit. I'll put it inside you. I will take away the heart of the stone from your flesh. And I'll give you a heart of real flesh. And my spirit I'll put with you. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes. I will cause you to be careful to obey my rules. The result is you will live in the land that I gave your forefathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. And again, he's quoting Jeremiah there. You can see that Ezekiel is just taking that new covenant and he's just spelling out exactly what God has promised. God says, I will deliver you from your uncleannesses. I will summon the grain. I will make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. Can you hear that this is kind of a reversal of being kicked out of Eden where you have to work to eat? Can you... Can you hear that, that there's picking up the language? A reversal of uh, what the exile from Eden did. I will make the fruit of the tree. These are all verbatim phrases from uh, Genesis. And the increase of the field abundant, that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. And then... You will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. And you will loathe yourselves for your iniquities and your abominations. And here's our inclusio. For it's not for your sake that I'm acting, declares the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded of your ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, on the day I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I'll cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places rebuilt. The land that was desolate shall be tilled instead of being a desolation that it was in the sight of all who passed by. And they will say, this desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden. The waste and desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited and then the nations that are left round about you will know that I am the Lord. I have rebuilt the ruined places. I have replanted that which was desolate. I am the Lord. I have spoken. And I will do it. So here's my question. Where in Ezekiel 36 did God say, if you do this? Did you hear any if statement? This is an agreement between the New Covenant people and God. And there isn't any if clause there. It's just 20 statements from God. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. So you might say, well, show me where that passage appears anywhere in the New Testament. 
Well, believe it or not, the New Testament writers were massively influenced by Ezekiel 36. In fact, when Jesus teaches us the Lord's Prayer, he's actually quoting Ezekiel 36. And I hope you're enough of a brilliant to say, well, prove that to me. Show me that in Scripture. Well, uh, before I do, I want to point out that this is, Ezekiel 36 is all about a God-centered theology versus a man-centered theology. Uh, God-centered theology is going to say things like Psalm 115, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be glory. A man-centered theology is going to hold up a mirror and start talking about how great you are intrinsically as a person. God-centered theology is all about the grace, the righteousness, the goodness, the power of God a man-centered theology is all about the goodness of me. And there are churches that are built on a man-centered theology. Churches that are uh, all about telling you how great you are inherently. The Bible is God-centered. Ezekiel 36 is God-centered. Uh, John Piper talks about uh, he wants to be like a telescope that takes huge, massive things like the glory of God that uh, appear very small to us, and he wants his theology to help us see uh, how great and how magnificent uh, God is. That's what Ezekiel 36 is doing, and that's why God starts off by saying it's not about you. It's not for your sake that I'm doing this. I'm not saving you because you're inherently better or smarter than other people. I'm doing this because I'm keeping my word. So the point. Show me where Jesus is quoting Ezekiel 36. Because I don't see it here and Probably you don't see it either. I'll vindicate the holiness of my great name. Uh, does any passage come to mind uh, where that appears in uh, the New Testament? And probably the answer is no. If we looked at the Lord's Prayer in the original language, the one on the top is that statement, I will vindicate my holy name, and the one on the bottom says, your holy name be vindicated. It's basically the same words in the same order. The only difference is, in Ezekiel 36, it says, I will do mine. And this one is written in the passive, your name be made holy. Jesus, when he taught us to pray, he's teaching us, Go to Ezekiel 36. Go to the promises of Ezekiel 36. Pray the promises in Ezekiel 36 because that's what God has obligated him do, himself to do to glorify his name. When we pray, hallowed be thy name, that's what we're praying. We're praying Ezekiel 36, 23, because Jesus uh, taught us to. Ezekiel 36 20 says, When they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my name. So can you hear it now? Hallowed be thy name. Uh, my name has been profaned. Jesus is saying, When you come to God in prayer, pray that God's name not be profaned, pray that it be made holy. Jesus is directing us to this passage in Ezekiel 36. And Paul picks up that same point in Romans 2.24, and he quotes Ezekiel 36 when he says, The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. 
Ezekiel 36 was massively important to the New Testament writers because they understood that Ezekiel 36 is the fullest explanation of the new covenant there is anywhere in the Bible. Jesus is telling us, pray uh, the, uh, that God's name would be made holy. Pray that the promises, the 20 unconditional promises that God would do that uh, in your life. What's the result? The result is a huge revival. Then the nations will know that I'm the Lord, declares the Lord. When I and vindicate the holiness, but you could translate it, when I massively make my name holy, when, when I mega holy my great name, the nations will know. Jesus is saying, every time you pray to God, pray that God's name would be massively made holy. Pray that it would be hallowed, not profane. And that promise, then the nations will know, is part of that first promise that God made to Abraham. Then the nations will know. So how is God's name made holy? It's made holy when God takes people from the nations. It's made holy when it says he will gather you from all the countries. And in Hebrew, um, there's a way uh, when you want to intensify something, um, uh, you put it in what's called the peel uh, uh, stem, and it basically bumps up whatever you're talking about to like the massive version of that. So if you said like, I paint the wall, uh, you would put that in the call, but if you wanted to say, like, I mega painted the wall, I painted every bit of it, uh, you would put it in the PL. This is in the PL. I will mega gather you. I'll gather the daylights out of you uh, from all your countries. I'll bring you to your own land. If we were Jewish people and we heard this, your own land, uh, in Hebrew, that's the word Adamah. Can you hear the word Adam there? I'll bring you to your own Adama, your own. Uh, I don't know how you would do that. I'll bring you to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you. Now, if we were Jews, we would get that this is exactly what Moses had done to Israel when Moses sprinkled bloody water on Israel. Moses sprinkled bloody water on Israel and that put them under the Mosaic Covenant. Do this and live. God is saying, I'm going to be the new Moses and I'm going to sprinkle pure water on you. And the result is you will be clean from all your uncleannesses. And I love that the ESV makes that a plural. It's plural in uh, Hebrew. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I love that in Hebrew, this is a peel. I will, uh, I will mega cleanse you. You're, you're dirty in a lot of different ways. And God says, I'm going to, I'm going to make you clean. But he doesn't just say, I'm going to make you clean. He's, he's a, I'm going to make you peel clean. I'm going to mega clean you. I'm going to give you a new heart. That's what Jeremiah had promised. I'll put it within you. I'll take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit in you. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. I will cause you to be careful to obey my rules. What's the result? You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers. You'll be my people and I'll be your God. I will deliver you from all your uncleannesses. I will summon grain. I will make it abundant. I'll not lay famine. I'll make the fruit great. 
And the result is you're going to repent and you're going to really repent and you're going to look at your old ways and be sorry, truly sorry that you've done those. The point of this is to see that this is all about what Jesus accomplished for us. It's not about us pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. It, it's not about trying to make willpower enough to, uh, to be good enough. It's about God doing something for us. God cleansing us. God forgiving us. God giving a new heart. And if, if I could only give a person one time to be able to read the Hebrew text, um, like if, if you could only read uh, the Hebrew text one time, this would be what I would want you to read. It says in English, I will cause you to be saved from all the different ways you're unclean. So in the, in the midst of all these promises from God, um, he says, I will cause you to be saved. And in Hebrew, that I will cause you to be saved is this word. And I don't even think you have to know how to read Hebrew to pick up what this is talking about. If I just say it out loud in Hebrew, I think you can almost hear it. Hoshiati. I will hoshiati you. Can you hear the word yasha in that hoshiati? Um, I don't know. That may be a... And you, remember how we talked about the name Jesus is the name Joshua, Yeshua? Can you hear that yasha there? It almost says in Hebrew, I will Jesus you from your sin. I will save you. I will, Yahweh saves you from your sins. I will cause you to be Jesus from all the different ways you're unclean. So where's the if clause? If you follow the rules, if you do this, if you, where is the if clause in that, those promises from God? If you're part of the New Covenant people, if you're in the New Covenant people, there is no if clause. There are just 20 unconditional promises from God. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. So how do you become part of the New Covenant people of God? Well, you turn from... Uh, your sin in repentance, turn from self-rule to God's rule and in helplessness, believe that Jesus met the uh, requirements of the covenant. That Jesus' righteousness has been righteous enough to get you into heaven. That's what Jesus said. Uh, Come to me all who labor and, are heavy, and I will give you rest. Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Repent and believe. If you repent and believe, you're part of the new covenant people of God. And Jesus is saying, these are the promises that God makes to you if you're part of this new covenant people. That's why this is so important. That's why the New Testament writers say things like, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. Paul says not that we're sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So, in the last 10 minutes of our class, it may be that a picture will help. 
uh, God is really good when he teaches us something to like give us truth and then give us a picture so we can kind of get our minds around it. And that happens in Ezekiel 37. God gives us the picture. So if you want to know what this looks like, this is the picture that God draws. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley, middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. I want you to imagine that. Like you're in peaceful sleep, you know, uh, you just uh, lay your head down and just went into the most peaceful sleep you've ever had. And all of a sudden God uh, shows up. And the next thing you know, you're standing with God in the middle of a valley full of dead people. And they're not just dead, they're like skeletons. You go from being completely asleep and you're standing with God in the middle of dead people. I don't know about you, but I would start thinking about what have I done? Like, has God brought me out here to kill me? I'm looking around, there are dead people everywhere. God is here. I'm here. Like, what is this? Imagine that. A, a, a valley full of dead people. And he walked me around, and behold, there were a lot of dead people. And their bones were very dry. And then the Lord asked Ezekiel a question, Son of man, can these bones live? These dead people. Can these dead people live? And Ezekiel was wise enough to give the only right answer to that question. Ezekiel says, you know whether they can live or not. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones. Prophesy and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. God is telling Ezekiel to preach to dead people. Preach to dead people. Preach, say, thus says the Lord God to these dry bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you will live. Now, if we were Jews and we were uh, reading this in Hebrew, the word there is the word ruach, which that word is the same word as spirit when it says the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Ruach will enter you. And remember, God has just said in uh, Ezekiel 36, my Ruach I will put in you, and you will obey. You, you will be my people, and I'll be your God. Now God is telling Ezekiel to preach and to say the Ruach is going to enter you, and you will live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and I will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put ruach in you, and you will live, and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked up, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them. But there was no ruach in them. So you got 
people and they're people, but they don't they don't have a ruach in them. Have you seen that before somewhere in the Bible? Like when God created the dirt man, Adam, and then he uh, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. He innatured him. Ezekiel is preaching and these dead bodies start turning into human beings, but they don't have ruach in them because God hasn't infusiaed his ruach into them yet. Ezekiel's preaching, but they're they're kind of not quite alive. Then he said to me, prophesy to the ruach. Prophesy, O son of man, say to the Ruach, thus says the Lord God, come from these four winds, O Ruach, and infusia o these slain that they may live. And so I prophesied, and the Ruach came into them, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. And you say, well, where's that in the New Testament? Well, when Jesus rose from the dead in John 20, 22, have you ever read that strange verse that says he went around and breathed on his disciples? Have you ever wondered, like, what in the world that was, well, look at the word. He went around and he emphasized them. He breathed into them. And you think, oh my goodness, this is what the Lord God did to Adam to make him a, a, a living man. And now Jesus. And then you realize, oh my goodness, he's purchased the new covenant. He's enabled spiritually dead people like you and like me and like Peter and like John and like Abraham and Mary and everybody spiritually dead to become recipients of the new covenant because it's about what he's done uh, for us and not what we've done uh, for ourselves. I see that my time uh, is gone. Uh, make sure you start working on uh, your memory verse. Uh, you, you can do that any time up until the start of the final exam. Also, if you haven't uh, gotten all 30 of your homework assignments yet, uh, make sure that you get, uh, do 30 total to get uh, full points on that. And I hope you have a very restful weekend. I'll see you on Monday.